Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is, and welcome. I'm Larry Erickson. This is the Erickson Report. And it seems uh, we had an election a little while ago. So I'm going to spend a good part of the show uh, running down some of my just general observations about various things about what happened on November 8th. I'll start by saying that I was actually very afraid, very concerned about um, what might happen that day. I actually told some friends that I was fearful for the outcome of the elections. I kept being afraid that the Democrats are going to repeat the mistake they made in 2016 when they blew the presidential election. They did it by essentially building their presidential campaign around the central theme, we're not Trump. He's a scumbag, he's a liar, he's a, he's a creep, so vote for us. Um, overlooking the fact, ignoring the fact that there were apparently, as they discovered to their pain, enough people uh, who either just didn't care or maybe even liked the fact that he was a, a crude, no good SOB. The idea that's the kind of no nonsense, I'll do whatever I want, tough guy that we need. We need that kind of strong leadership. Now, it's not to say that Democrats did not talk at all about other things, but that was sort of like the underlying theme of their whole campaign. Um, I was afraid they're going to do the same thing this time. See, they had decided and did make the, again, overall theme, the underlying the uh, theme of their campaign, reproductive rights. Now, while that certainly is an important issue, um, my concern was that the further we got from Dobbs, further we got from Roe being overturned, um, the more that really burning anger tended to fade, as, as it always will in, when something like that happens. And they were, even as polls indicated that people were thinking less about reproductive rights and more about things like inflation and crime, the Democrats weren't really addressing those. In fact, there were Democratic strategists who were urging Democratic candidates to not talk about, uh, about crime, to not talk about the economy. Even, even though there are clearly good things that Democrats could say on their own behalf on both of those issues, there are some people actually tell them to av actively avoid them and just focus on reproductive rights. And I was really afraid that they do the same thing that they did in 2016, which was blow the campaign by not really paying attention to what it appeared people were thinking about the most. Well, as it turns out, my fears were overblown. The Democrats actually did better than was expected. And in fact, they actually held their own as the predicted red wave or red tsunami uh, turned out to be more of a pink ripple. And, and there, there was a reason for this. One is that, um, according to exit polls, those people who voted for Democrats, reproductive rights was high on their list of concerns, um, followed by threats to democracy. Whereas those who voted for Republicans, voted for goppers, uh, were focused more on the economy and crime. Now, it was claimed that this actually validated the, the Democrats' strategy, but I'm not going to give up my, on my own analysis quite that easily because I figure that to hold your own, to not get swamped, is not exactly a stirring call to victory. It's not exactly a stirring call to advancement. Um, and I just figure had the Democrats spent some time on, on, on crime, some time in the economy, some time responding to the attack, because, you know, we should have learned, at least from the time of John Kerry's run for presidency, that you can't let attacks go unanswered. Now, in that case, those are personal attacks on Kerry as opposed to issue attacks. But um, still, we should have learned you can't, especially when you have, again, good things you could say on your own behalf, you can't just let attacks like that go on day after day without expecting it to have some influence. So, frankly, I think if the Democrats had spent just some time responding, some time talking about the good in the economy, the good things they could say about crime, uh, because I don't know if you realize this or not, but even after the uptick in violent crime, which actually had already started to go back down, 
even at the peak of that uptick, violent crime was still way below where it was around 1990. And certainly that could have been emphasized. Yeah, things have gotten worse in this case. Yes, we have to deal with this. But still, you know, thanks to various policies that we among, have put in place over the past 30 years, you are much better off than you were then. So I think they could have done better than just hold their own. But in any event, um, as, as was expected, it, the, the, the goppers appear poised to take the House of Representatives. Now, it hasn't been confirmed. By the time I write this, they still have not gotten uh, 218 confirmed wins, which is what they need for the majority, because there are still a bunch out in the West Coast that are not settled. Um, but it's not particularly unexpected. I mean, it's almost traditional. In fact, it is traditional for the party in power in the White House to lose seats in Congress during the midterms. It, it almost never, almost never do they gain them. In the last four midterm elections, the president's party has lost an average of 37 House seats. In fact, at Obama's first midterm in 2010, Democrats lost 64 seats in the House. In 2018, which was Tweety Pie's midterm, the, the Goppers lost 42. This time, the Democrats are, are, are projected at this point to lose about 12. That is enough to give the Goppers uh, a majority in the House so we can look forward to two years of ongoing massive investigations about pretty much anything under the sun for actually no purpose whatsoever. But it will give them a majority, but a small majority, about as large, in fact, as the Democrats have now. Meanwhile, the Senate is still undecided. The Senate is still undecided because um, uh, Arizona and Nevada are still clo too close to call, with um, Catherine Cortez Masto uh, down by about 1% in Nevada, and Mark Kelly up by about 5.5% in Arizona. Meanwhile, Georgia, as I expect you know, is headed to a runoff on December 6th, with the final tally showing Raphael Warnock ahead of Herschel, how the hell can anybody vote for that man, Walker, by about 1.6%. Now, the thing is, you have to say Warnock is a clear favorite in the runoff, not only because he came in first in the general, but also because the third candidate who was in that race, a guy named Chase Oliver, who got a couple of percent of the vote, uh, he presented a pretty liberal platform. So you got to figure anybody that voted for him that votes in the runoff is going to vote for Warnock over Walker, um, which means uh, that if Kelly can hold his lead, even if, Masto, uh, even if Masto falls short, you'd still wind up with a 50-50 Senate, which because of holding the White House and then the vice presidency, Democrats still control the Senate. Uh, some more general notes about the election. Something that, a couple of things that, uh, one thing that made me feel good, I just liked it, liked it being noted. Hannah Trudeau, uh, you may not know who she is, but she's the senior political correspondent at TheHill.com. She said, and I'm quoting her tweet, the entire, the entire Bernie Sanders-aligned wing of the Democratic Party won tonight, from Fetterman in the Senate to the new squad members in the House. A string of progressives won in the, in the election. Uh, and that was just nice to hear, nice to know. Uh, and the, the other thing is that the reason the Democrats did as well as they did, voters under 30, the youth vote, um, just consider this. CNN had a uh, national exit poll in the House, for the House of Representatives vote, okay? National exit poll. For people 65 and over, you know, my cohort, they voted for Republicans by 13 percentage points. For the age group 45 to 64, they voted for Goppers by 11 percentage points. Those 30 to 44 voted Democratic by that's two percentage points, pretty much a 50-50 split. Those 18 to 29 went Democratic by 28 percentage points. That's what got the Democrats what they did. People under 30 turned out and voted heavily for Democrats. So maybe, you know, Democrats should make sure to pay even more attention to the issues that are of concern to that group of people. All right, next up. Next up, uh, Tuesday's elections played out 
as Americans have grown increasingly worried about the threats to democracy that we face. Roughly 7 in 10 voters, according to uh, exit polling, about 7 in 10 voters said that American democracy is very or somewhat threatened. Um, but at the same time, voters express confidence that the elections in their state would be done properly and fairly. About 80% of voters said that, that they were very or somewhat confident that elections in their state would be done properly, which kind of reminded me of the old thing about the Congress. People always saying, the Congress, they suck, they're terrible, they're awful. awful. What about your representative? Oh, they're okay. It's all those other ones that suck so much. But well, more importantly than that, more importantly than that actually, is that the, the Washington Post they did an analysis of 569 Gopper nominees, uh, uh, Gopper nominees for public office in the country. They found that 291 of them, 51 percent of the total, questioned or refused to accept the fact that Joe Blodden legitimately won the presidency in 2020. Of those, 150 to 200, at least half of the total won. Now, the what makes it not quite so bad, the vast majority of those who won were running for the House of Representatives, um, which means that they won't be directly involved in overseeing elections. And a lot of those campaign, most of them, in fact, campaign on a range of issues, you know, particularly, you know, inflation and crime, typical Republican talking points, rather than, rather than election denial. So it's really not clear how strongly their voters agreed with them on that. Um, but, of course, if the Goppers win the House, which they probably will at this point, uh, um, that still could be an issue because those election deniers will amount to a sizable majority of the Republican caucus in the House, which means they could drive the selection of the Speaker of the House, who will be the person to preside over the House in 2024 at a time when a presidential election may actually be being contested. So while this development, this particular development, is not as threatening as it might have been, it certainly is not non-threatening. What's more important, what's more important is the state level. That's an area where governors, secretaries of state, attorneys general, and so on, have significant power in overseeing, conducting, and certifying elections. That's where the power really is. And there, happily, the news is not so good for the deniers, many of them Many of them lost. In Arizona, it looks like the whole slate lost. Now, that doesn't mean some of those deniers didn't get into some, some of those important offices, but it does mean that not nearly as many got in as were feared. But this doesn't mean, of course, that the issue goes away. Uh, even before the polls closed, and even before many states even started releasing any vote totals. Far-right users on, t on various Telegram channels and other far-right fringe sites were spreading cons conspiracy theories trying to declare the entire election fraudulent. Consider one particular example, Maricopa County, Arizona. It's the largest county in Arizona. It's, uh, um, they had some trouble with their voting machines, the tabulating machines, because they're like, like a lot of places do. Um, you have a paper ballot, you mark it off, it puts it to a machine, the machine is an optical scanner that reads what you voted and tabulates it. Well, they had some problems with some of the machines. They said, we have a problem, uh, we're trying to figure out what it is and what we can do about it, but don't worry, those votes will be counted because we still have the paper ballots and we'll just hand count them after the polls close, okay? This was considered uh, terribly conspiratorial. In fact, Carrie Lake, and she's the utterly wacko, in fact, she, I'm sorry, she's a Karen, okay? Just, she's a Karen. The incredibly wacko Gopper candidate for governor of Arizona. Um, she looked at the situation where election officials said, we have a problem where we're checking into, oh, we figured out what the problem is, we're getting it fixed, don't worry, all the ballots will be counted uh, because we still have the paper ballots and we can still count the ones that we're problem with, we can count them after the fact. By the way, the problem turned out to be that there was a problem with the printing on the paper ballot, uh, which meant the machine had trouble reading it. Uh, 
But even look at all that, you know, we got a problem. They announced they had a problem. We're fixing the problem. Don't worry, all the ballots will be counted. She said those glitches were evidence of fraud. That's how bad it has gotten. Uh, Michigan Secretary of State Joycelyn Benson, who herself has been the target of such claims of fraud and deceit and so on, noted that, I like this, I like her quote, there are always things that potentially could be seized upon that really have no impact. She called the whole conspiracy claims, quoting again, a political strategy that some have chosen to pursue to the detriment of who we are as Americans and our democracy. Right on, Secretary Benson. Uh, another surprise, actually, that occurred on Election Day was that Democrats overperformed. Again, they beat expectations in state legislative races. That, uh, those are the kind of red, uh, uh, races that, over the last few cycles, they proved to be dismal, incompetent failures. But this time, they've actually increased the number of states where they control one or both chambers, uh, uh, at least Michigan and Minnesota, I know of. Uh, now they're, they've increased the number of states where they control both chambers and the governorship, which is, you know, the so-called trifecta. And they actually have two more governors. They added two governorships to their party totals. I meanwhile, something that's of importance to me, progressive prosecutors, these are you know, district attorneys, prosecutors, but they make reform, these folks make reform of the criminal justice system part of their platform and part of their practice in office. They actually did well in the midterms. They win, they winning in places like, um, as was said by Laura uh, uh, Bazelon, who is the director of the Innocence Commission, which is a commission inside the San Francisco DA's office. She said they won, quoting her, in places purple and blue and even red. The right wing has tried to verify, uh, bury rather, the whole progressive prosecutor movement, the whole movement of criminal justice uh, under a barrage of criminals running wild and these prosecutors just letting criminals run wild in the streets with smears of progressive prosecutors, okay? This time, the right wing failed. Meanwhile, it turns out the Democrats were right about one thing. The protection of reproductive rights is broadly popular. Uh, protection of such rights was on the ballot in five states. It won in all five. Voters in California, Vermont, and Michigan added protections for reproductive rights to their state constitutions. While meanwhile, voters in bright red, uh, in, in, in bright red Montana and even brighter red Kentucky rejected measures that would have added restrictions to getting uh, reproductive rights. Add the vote in Kansas in August uh, that rejected a ballot measure that would have given the state legislature the authority to restrict abortion access to a, uh, an amendment to the state constitution, and you find reproductive rights going for six for six in this election cycle. Um, another thing that was on the ballot in five states was legalization of recreational marijuana. In Maryland and Missouri, they voted yes. Recreational marijuana is now legal there. Arkansas, North Dakota, and South Dakota said no. However, it is worth noting that in all five of those states, including the three that said no, obviously, medical marijuana is already legal. As of now, 21 states plus the District of Columbia have legal recreational marijuana, something that uh, polls say about 60% of the public favors. Well, another thing, something that uh, South Dakota voters uh, did support, something that's actually, frankly, more important to me. Um, I've actually been in favor of legalization of recreational marijuana for, oh God, over 50 years, believe it or not. But it's, it's not something that's been like high on my list of personal political priorities. Um, but something I, that is more, more important to me, 56% of voters in South Dakota supported expanding Medicaid in the state under the Affordable Care Act. This expansion of Medicaid affects 40,000 people in South Dakota, many of whom uh, are now going to be able to get on Medicaid. A lot of those people could not afford health care without this. All right, finally for now on the election. Something of which a lot of people may well be unaware. 
The 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution did not outright ban slavery. It didn't. What it actually says, and I'm quoting it here now, it actually says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. In other words, slavery under the Constitution is lawful and legal for a punishment of a crime which is why there has been and continues to be forced labor in U.S. prisons. Now today, such, such labor, such prison labor, is a multi-billion dollar industry with prisoners are essentially given the choice of working for pennies on the dollar and pretty much almost free, or being punished by being denied things like phone calls or visits with family or just being thrown into solitary confinement. Nearly 20 states had language in their state constitutions permitting slavery and involuntary servitude for prisoners. On election day, four of those states said, not anymore, not here. Voters in Alabama, Oregon, Tennessee, and Vermont approved measures to remove that language from their state constitutions. A fifth measure in Louisiana only failed because its backers told people to reject it because they realized they'd screwed up the legalese and it didn't clearly outlaw involuntary servitude. Max Parthas, he's the campaign coordinator for the Abolish Slavery National Network, says his network hopes to have this notion on the ballot in a dozen of those remaining states next election cycle. Okay, and we are now going to take a break. And we are back, and I'm going to spend uh, what time I have left uh, going uh, a little more about uh, something I've talked a lot about recently, um, and I'm doubt we're talking about even more in the future. How many of you remember, if you're old like me, you might remember time, it wasn't actually, it wasn't that long ago, when there was a big thing about abortion regret, about women, you know, supposedly all these massive numbers of women who had had abortions and now we're regretting, oh my God, I killed my baby, I'm so sorry, uh, all as a means to try to stampede the public into opposing abortion on the idea that it's just a horrible thing that just causes guilt and pain and suffering. Well, we're seeing the same thing now with regard to transgender youth. Transition regret is the term. Uh, and there's all these stories and tales now of kids pressured into transition by their parents or by peer pressure or something, uh, and then desperately wishing that they could undo this. Well, the fact is, the more data we get in, the more we know, the more research is done, the more the question gets asked, the more we know that transgender youth know who they are and they know what is right for them. And the manufactured fears over transition regret, so-called transition regret, are just another tactic by the reactionaries to deny the reality of trans kids' lives. The results of a study published in 2014 of 50 years of data from Sweden of people who applied for sexual reassignment or more accurately gender affirmation surgery found that of 767 transgender people, only 2.2% of those participants expressed any regret after undergoing the surgery. In fact, importantly, the numbers are even lower for non-surgical transitions, uh, such as taking puberty blockers. According to a 2018 study of a cohort of transgender young adults at the largest gender identity clinic in the Netherlands, only 1.9% of adolescents who started puberty suppressants did not go on to pursue hormone therapy, which is the usual next step in transitioning. In other words, once these, once these young folks started transitioning, 98.1% of them continued. And you also have to ask why those who stopped, why did they? Why did they? 
Because in, in a 2015 survey of 28,000 people conducted by the U.S.-based National Center for Transgender Equality, only 8% of those respondents reported detransitioning, and 62% of them said they only did that temporarily. In other words, they stopped and then went back to transitioning. The most common reason for detransitioning, according to the survey, was pressure from a parent. Only 0.4%, less than one half of 1% of those respondents said they detransitioned because they realized that it actually wasn't for them after all. And now we have another, and by the way, I should mention, remember all of this, uh, all non-surgical all non-surgical transitions are reversible, they're entirely reversible. If you ever decide it's wrong for you, yes, you can just stop. But now I want to mention this, what brought all this up. We have another study. This one was published on October 20th in The Lancet. It is one of the most prestigious medical journals in the entire world. The study checked the medical records of 720 patients at Amsterdam UMC, you know, University Medical Center's uh, Center for Expertise on Gender Dysphoria. Uh, these are people who had historically received at least three months of puberty blockers starting before they turned 18, and they wanted to see how many continued on to hormone replacement therapy medication. In other words, how many of them continued transitioning into adulthood. At the end of the data collection period, 98% of those patients had active hormone therapy replacement um, uh, prescriptions. And because as before, you don't know why, those, why that 2% stopped. Indeed, most of those who stopped had had some form of gonadectomy, gonadectomy rather. Um, in other words, they had had gender-affirming surgery. So they may not know that they still need the hormone replacement therapy in order to avoid effects like osteoporosis and, and some potential others. Some of those folks may have decided that they're non-binary and that they actually didn't feel the need to transition any further than they had. Um, some may have, in fact, detransitioned, decided it was wrong for them, and some may have been pressured into stopping. Because remember, the main reason people reported uh, in that 2015 survey for why they stopped was pressure from parents. It's, it's simply a fact. It's simply a fact. Despite the screeching from the reactionaries, transgender adolescents know who they are. According to the Williams Institute at the U UCLA School of Law, there are an estimated 1.4 million transgender adults in the United States. The UK's Government uh, Equalities Office tentatively estimates 200,000 to 500,000 in the UK and the Northern Ireland. Okay. Even if there are as many trans youth in the U.S. as there are adults from, those, from that survey, and that combined figure is, is off by an order of magnitude, that is, there are 10 times as many people as they are estimated, you're still talking about about 8% of the U.S. population. So much hatred, so much bile, so much fear directed towards so few people. It really is a deep moral outrage. That's it for this week. I'm done. I'm out of here. We will see you in two weeks for my traditional um, true story of the first Thanksgiving episode. So we look forward to seeing you then. We will see you in two weeks. Uh, until now, you have the best two weeks you possibly can. As always, peace.